Hey, hey everyone, it's Sleepy Reader, aka Damien. Um, this is my comic book countdown slash comic book thoughts. Super subjective based on my experiences as a reader. Ranking the 11 comics I picked up this past Wednesday. It took me a while to get to them all. I got very distracted by trying to read Barry Windsor Smith's Monsters. I didn't. I only got about halfway through. I, it was a very slow read for me. Um, and I also got about halfway through this graphic novel called Izuna, Volume 1, which is quite interesting, but also somehow a slow read for me. But nothing compared to Mo Monsters is what really slowed me down. Another thing I read this week that was not new comics that I really enjoyed was this um, treasury edition called The Best of DC from 1977. And it's got Neil Adams and Kurt Swan and Jim Aparo and Joe Kubert. So it certainly makes sense as kind of a best of. I think maybe I'll, if I have time, I might make a separate video about that. I just uh, had some thoughts about it. But I'm going to focus, as I always do in these countdown videos, on just what was that I read that was new from this past Wednesday. And uh, it was all interesting, fun reads, actually, but none all at the same time, none that wowed me and utterly knocked my socks off. So it was kind of a in the middle kind of week in a way. I mean, I was glad I was reading lots of comics, but I couldn't, you know, find that one that just made my week. So I've done my best to rank them in terms of how much particular pleasure I got out of reading them. Um, I didn't really hate anything except for my number 11, Red Sonja. I hated the colors. Um, I did not hate the art. I did not hate the writing, but the colors were just way too dark for me and way just, I don't know. They just took away from the reading experience, in my opinion. Even the few daylight scenes, the colors were not terribly appealing. The artist, Mortat, who is a pretty good comic book artist, but I he, he did the coloring, and I just don't understand what he's doing to his own artwork here with this coloring. Um, and it's uh, written by uh, Paul Motti and, um, Paul Motti and Aunt Amanda Connor, the uh, husband and wife writing team. And, and Amanda Connor did that cover, which is kind of interesting. That hair is kind of crazy. I wonder if it's a bit of a homage to Frank Thorne's Red Sonja hair. I don't know. That's, that's just a guess. This seemed like a, a decent enough Red Sonja story. I just I was not particularly grabbed by it, but I enjoyed reading it. Um, probably because of the color, I won't pick up this series. Uh, I was kind of... This was just a grab off off the um, off the shelves, and I wasn't expecting it to end up being my favorite. But I was kind of curious, and you know, when I heard that Moritat was the artist, that seemed promising because he's in my mind a higher level artist than than uh, than Dynamite often hires. But uh, you know, he must love those colors because that's what he put on there. But it just didn't work for me. Um, and then in at number ten is Inkblot, which I usually rank a bit higher than that. But of course, all of these were kind of middling. But for Inkblot in general, this issue was less engaging, even though it seemed to have more bearing on our central story in a sense that the original narrator is back with the cat and she goes to visit some of her sisters and she's part of some kind of family that rules over multiple dimensions and we have her uh, getting caught in the middle of a fight between her two sisters which should be interesting but somehow I mean it was interesting enough because all of these comics were interesting but somehow was not as engaging and charming as other issues of Inkblot. Um, then in a issue nine I had a little trouble placing this because I did have quite a bit of fun reading it but this is called uh, Marjorie Finnegan's Temporal Crime. Marjorie Finnegan's Temporal. That seems odd because she commits multiple crimes, not just one. <laughs> this is by Garth Innes, and uh, this is not the Garth Innes that wrote Sarah. I mean, it is the same guy, but it is not 
it's as if it's completely different writer Sarah that uh, TKA TKO book about Soviet sharpshooters during World War II. This is an adolescent. Let's get women in sexy clothing, clothing, shooting guns style comic book. And um, I was expecting a little more from it. Uh, maybe a little more from the artist, Goran Suzuka. I seem to remember art by him that had more personality than this. Um, this is very competently done and the coloring is fine at least. Um, so I may or may not pick this up off the... Uh, off the shelves again. It's an AWA book um, who usually I'm immediately struck by the fact that their their books seem like movie pitches. Um, but yeah, and this could be a movie pitch. We've got we've got uh, the temporal cop who's a sis sister to the temporal um, criminal. And we have a lot of nice touches actually like this head she keeps around to do her mathematical calculations for her for time travel. For whatever reason, she's obsessed with uh, David Bowie and his Ziggy Stardust period, I guess. Um, the title of the story is a Ziggy Stardust song title, or a line from one of the songs, Let All the Children Boogie, or as uh, I think uh, uh, David Bowie said, Let All the Children Boogie, but <laughs> I it, it doesn't, uh, there's David Bowie on the wall there. It seems like, in a way, with that David Bowie kind of 1972 David Bowie uh, reference and such, it seems like an old guy trying to be hip and groovy. <laughs> I don't know. And, you know, being hip and groovy by uh, tagging back to uh, David Bowie's Ziggy Stardust doesn't seem particularly unique or special in a way. So I think because I kind of keyed into this as kind of a, a cheesecake book, I, I perhaps judged it harshly in a way. As I talk about it, I feel like I, I definitely enjoyed reading it, but at the same time didn't have a high opinion of it, if that makes sense. Because uh, it's kind of just an exploitation book. I enjoy, I'm enjoying a lot The Wrong Earth Night and Day, um, and that continues with issue four. I'm thinking this must go six issues. Um, this is the the sequel. There was a there was a Wrong Earth comic, then it had a prequel. Now it has its sequel, where the uh, two Batman analogs, Dragonfly Man and uh, Dragonfly, uh, meet and team up and have to fight someone who is poisoning the water in both their worlds. And it's developing very nicely. And there's a kind of a conflict of who cares more about. Um, the sidekick, what's his name? Uh, darn, I can't remember the sidekick's name. And there's some cool visuals. I mean, in a way, kind of like this uh, temporal crime book, the artwork has a certain generic quality, but it seems to have a little more personality. It's it's by Jamal Eigel, I believe, the artwork. Um, yeah, and there's a certain extra sense of humor to it that seems to have a little more flair, I suppose. I suppose. Um, well, there's a twist on the last page I won't show you, but I thoroughly I thoroughly enjoyed this, and it, it continues to be this fun, weird, uh, spoof, parody, um, black comedy uh, based around the Batman concept. And then in at number seven, I am putting Beasts of Burden, Occupied Territory. This issue was this is issue two in that this miniseries, much better than issue one, uh, in terms of the writing. There was more personality. Um, we get a whole kind of buddy story between these two talking dogs, one of whom is an old, wise dog, as it's called, a magical dog that lives a long time, and the others, more of a regular dog. This is uh, post World War II in occupied Japan, uh, so the the younger dog or the more regular dog was kind of the shipboard dog on a Navy ship. And then they just left him in Japan at the at the base. And it's interesting. He says, you know, why are you helping the humans? It kind of broke my heart when the dog said, why are you helping the humans? Most humans are crap. <laughs> I like to think dogs love us. Um, but it's it's got this incredible artwork by Benjamin Dewey, 
who we should be seeing more of on more major books. Let me see. There's some, and I think he does the coloring himself. He's a bit conservative on the color, but it kind of works every once in a while when he throws in some more interesting splashes of artwork. Um, and he's a master at, at dogs and animals with expressions. And we're kind of, this is kind of a journey into the dark side of this magical Japanese demon haunted forest where they meet strange creatures and then the horrifying creature, they haven't named what it is yet. And, uh, and then, uh, other strange creatures that tell them to go back. Oh, and these heads with tentacles. Um, so it's very inventive and it's kind of a cool book. Now I'm thinking maybe I should have ranked it higher. Here's all the, all these weird uh, forest creatures in the Japanese forest telling them to go back and don't venture any further, but they keep going. Um, so I don't know how many issues this is supposed to be. I'm assuming maybe for the way most, um, the way most, uh, Dark Horse comics are. Where's my water? Just water in here, not tea today. Okay, in at number six is this one shot. It's oversized. Here's the size of a regular book from Aftershock, who who I feel kind of rips people off with the prices of their first issues. But on this one shot with this oversized, you know, 48 page story it's seven bucks so that i thought was a very good price it's basically a a slender trade a, a graphic novella if you will and it's kind of a it, it's it's written by colin bunn art by dalibor tilajic i don't know how to pronounce his name um and it's kind of your classic horror story with a bit of a twist towards the end um, involving a tattoo artist and a mysterious girl who always asks for him to give her tattoos. And uh, then she comes back a few weeks later and whatever tattoo he gave her was gone and she asks for a new one. And she asks him to be creative and just uh, improvise on her skin. And we do get interesting tattoo designs uh, throughout the book and kind of a build up of the mystery. And all, at the same time, uh, a very sort of artful buildup of our character Niles. Niles is the tattoo artist. Uh, his life and character, which is that his wife and daughter or girlfriend and daughter died in a car accident. And his life has kind of been meaningless and adrift ever since. He just goes to work, gets drunk, goes home, goes to work, gets drunk, goes home. Um, and so we think we're headed into a romance here. Uh, between Niles and this mysterious woman who likes his tattoos so much. But um, in the end, well, there's another tattoo uh, example. In the end, it's not what, what I was thinking. Um, it's a pretty good twist. And uh, yeah, he even does, oop, naughty stuff. He even does uh, do the, do a little bit of romantic stuff with her, but it still doesn't turn out the way we're thinking there's another tattoo, but I won't tell you that. But it was it was quite a satisfying horror story. It was kind of just a horror story. It didn't transcend it or anything, but it's very satisfying. Um, so the, and maybe the reason it didn't the the art is very competent, but it doesn't stand out in my mind afterwards. Like I can't even identify. I would never be able to identify that uh, artist again. The uh, Dilibor Telegic, except for those tattoo designs, he just was extremely competent commercial art, you might say. Okay, and more sort of unique, and maybe that's why some of these are up near the top, because I, like I said, I've enjoyed all of these comics, but more unique in at number five for me was Beckstar. And Beckstar is... Um, this woman, I believe. The cover art, uh, to me, this is not a very good cover. And it doesn't give a sense of the more kind of uh, interesting indie style artwork that we get on the inside, which has, you know, a, to me, a very tasty mix of some more uh, anime Asian type of things and a more scribbly looking uh, underground kind of style, you might say, or maybe a web web comics kind of style and 
This is a story all, all about criminals, and it, it has a lot of pizzazz and fun characters. Um, each each uh, a group of criminals used to work together, and they pulled off a big job, or they were bounty hunters maybe or something, but they were hired by someone to go get this treasure, and they kept the three or four MacGuffin, magical MacGuffin kind of things. This is in a science fiction setting. Magical MacGuffin kind of things that they found for themselves. Um and then split up and now one of them wants to get kill all the others and get all the MacGuffin things so in a sense it's kind of a a classic plot but it's done with a lot of verve and it it kind of reminds me of some of the cool not not in the visuals of course because they're very up-to-date and modern but it kind of reminds me of some of the cool sci-fi series we used to get from indie comics in the 80s like uh, the type of thing you might get from Eclipse or maybe even in Warrior magazine, or um, some, or from uh, ep- from the Epic line of comics, or something. They would put out these sci-fi magazines or comics, and so it's quite good. And it it uh, has a very good lived-in future. Um, you know, some elements that are pretty much the same as they would be in in modern times, I suppose, with kind of the mob and the the casinos and things like that. But still. A lot of fun. I'll definitely pick up the next issue of Beckstar. And very similar in its sort of uh, taking uh, old, a lot of familiar sci-fi stuff, but doing it with kind of a modern verve is Jenny Zero, which I'm putting at my number four spot. It's about a ex-kaiju monster fighter who is now a drunken alcoholic. I guess her father was the leader of the kaiju fighters and he dragged her into it and he's dead now and she hates him or she said he's dead now. Um, And her uncle comes to draw her back and get her to fight the new kaiju. Um, But it's, so it's got a lot of attitude and it's got a very, I don't know, I I mean, this is simplification, but the artwork kind of, to me, comes out of the Paul Pope school of artwork, if that makes sense. Um, Really kind of nice, uh, interesting colors. I probably should have been talking, naming the artists. Like, this Beckstar was from Mad Cave, um, which is, I think, my first time getting a Mad Cave comic. Surprised it actually showed up at my shop. And the the creators are Joe Carrillo, the writer, Lorenzo Colangeli, the artist, and Sweeney Boo, the... Oh, that's the cover artist who I didn't like. So I guess uh, Lorenzo Colangeli on here did must have done these colors that I liked a lot. And in here, I also liked the colors a lot. And it was uh, illustrated by Magenta King and color art by Megan Hong. It's interesting. Both of these have are, are female-led comics, but they are still written by males. Um, so maybe males are becoming more enlightened and right, putting more female-led comics in their comics. So maybe that's purely economics with more female readers out there now. Um, but we still don't see a lot of female writers. Um, that doesn't make, I'm, that's not putting down this comic, but I was just thinking of that as I was reading a lot of female-led comics um, that were not written by women. Um, so... Yeah, she has her buddy who is sort of in on her partying, but and then a boyfriend who's supplying all the drugs. Uh, but then she gets pulled back in by her uncle who, uh, who sent the boyfriend packing, I guess. Uh, I, I'm not doing a good job of describing this. But uh, the last page ends with kind of a twist that's going to make the following issues more interesting or less interesting I, I can't say yet um, I liked that her her monster fighting tech was this weird looks like part machine part biological mechanism that attaches to her arm but she uh, uh, there's the kaiju I, I think the kaiju could have used some work but that's being picky uh, so many uh, kaiju based comics out right now it's a real trend (laughs) so yeah i won't show you that last page so i enjoyed that a lot um in at number three always a top contender it seems is the immortal hulk 
people who say they've been stretching out this story too much are right. I still think it's going to read really great in trade. It's a bit odd to read in individual issues now. It used to, each individual issue kind of stood by itself. It takes a little more remembering what happened last issue as you pick up the next issue. Now, a fantastic cover by uh, Mr. Ross. Great art on the inside from uh, Joe Bennett. Um, so it progress. I, I admit that it's it's a more stretched out story than it should be, uh, judging from the way it was written towards the beginning of the fifty issue run, but I'm still enjoying it a heck of a lot, and um, it's still this was kind of a fun big battle issue, fighting the first the Hulk fights the UFOs, then he tries to go to a bar and get a drink because he's got such a good buzz on from having all his powers back and and beating up people and then they send in the avengers and he has a big battle with thor and i assume the next issue even more battles so if you just like hulk battles you probably could just grab this and say i don't care what the, the main plot is let's see hulk fight all these people and you'd have a good time okay i gotta check something in the kitchen and i'll be right okay with that non-crisis averted in at number two for me is this new image book called the good asian um, I really appreciated its kind of historical context and you, uh, you are entertained, but you also feel like you're learning a bit something about, uh, this, the situation of Asians and particularly Chinese in the United States in the 1930s and, and in the years leading up to that. I was a bit confused when our main character is in a uh, detention place for immigrants who are not being let into the U.S. as they wait to see if, if their case will go through and they will be let in, because apparently Chinese were, were banned, along with other Asians, from entering the United States uh, at this time and for quite many years before. Um, but, but then it develops as kind of a... Uh, Chinatown mystery story with white cops and one Asian detective working with them. I don't know if he's a cop or just helps out the cops as a, de a detective from the Asian community. Um, but I thought it was quite a gripping mystery story. I just didn't know why he was in that detention zone at the beginning of the story, other than they wanted us to see what was going on at that time. Um, but it, it feels like it gives us a number of layers. And so it, it feels like it's providing both a good mystery and a good sort of picture of, of a certain world, so to speak, a certain place in time, San Francisco in the 1930s, um, with all the tensions and difficulties that an Asian police officer or detective is facing and, and other Asians around him. So um, it, it, it just promises, it's hard to tell, you know, with a mystery story, how it will all end up and what I'll feel about it when the whole story is told, but it's extremely promising and uh, very interesting to me. Yeah, so I uh, really enjoyed that. Um, and then I'm putting at number one, Kaiju Max, but with less enthusiasm than back in the day in Kaiju Max season one and two and maybe season three, I was always making Kaiju Max my number one. And it's still a comic I like a lot, but to a certain extent, it's it's worn out its welcome with me. It's uh, it's just less exciting. It, it, it uh, sticks to variations of its formula, which is a very good formula um, playing off of prison movies and crime or prison TV shows and crime stories and I know he's researched a lot about life in prison and that sort of thing uh, and and being creative with making up all these different kaiju and this final season looks to be about an, an alien invasion and attack on earth where they kind of coerce the kaiju prisoners uh, from kaiju max to work uh, in the defense of earth for a lessening of their sentences not they don't even get off completely and it looks like at first they're telling them you're you're not going to be in the front lines at risk, but it looks like they want to put them at risk. And it shows us a various kaiju, many of whom we're, we're familiar with from other seasons um, and their motivations and and 
why they're signing up for this fight. Um, and like, there's a lot of intriguing characters as there always are now. I f I'm finding this character. I don't think I caught his name though. No, I did. I did his name is Woofy. This character here, that's him as a child, a child monster, and that's him as a grown-up monster incarcerated in prison. And he's refusing to go in the fight, but he's told that he could be mind controlled to fight. Um, but so I, I'm hoping he's one of the kind of the central characters. There's also this intriguing uh, bar scene at a cliff in the ocean because um, it's not always, I mean, <clears throat> the realities of this world aren't always fully explained to us, which is fine. But how you have, in a world where kaiju probably aren't very welcome, how you have a bar set up in a, in a cliff by the ocean I don't know. So these are the, there's the bar top, top, and these are the stools, and they're all just giant rock formations, and this is the ocean here. Anyway, it was a cool issue, and even though I'm somewhat less excited by Kaiju Max at this time, I'm excited for this sixth and final season, and eager to see where it goes, and I am still double dipping on Kaiju Max. I have the first first four seasons, season one and two, and then season three and four in giant size, beautiful hardbacks. Um, so I plan to get the last two seasons that way too, along with getting the single issues. So I'm still a big Kaiju Max fan. And in a week of without the comics that utterly wow me, Kaiju Max uh, does claw its way to the top and the number one position. So uh, that's where I stand this week with comic book reading, and uh, I hope to get back to you again soon. And I hope you all had a great week of comic book reading also.